Oh, it's nine o'clock, well, eight o'clock UT summertime. Hello to our viewers um, and welcome to... Um, and I wanted to start the interview, David, with some uh, biograph uh, biography stuff. Now, in your Wikipedia article, um, it says that you were in North Shields and grew up in 1970s London. Now, your father was Adrian Malone, who made... Uh, and uh, you studied in America, where you studied... Well, biological anthropology. Now, I wanted to ask you about, um, you know, your early life, where you went to school, and how you went to Swarthmore, which is quite an elite college. Um, was there a culture shock? Is there a, any story in there? Well, going to Swarthmore. Yeah. Um, yeah, I suppose there was, because um, when we lived in England, I just went to the. Um, Ashford Grammar School, Ashford and Middlesex. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we moved to America. And um, I, we I ended up going to two private schools, which I'd never been to before. Um, and that really was a culture shock. Um, and I went there because my parents were told that American uh, state schools, whether they were or not, but that's what my parents believed. Uh, and then when it came to university, I wanted to go to the best university I could and the most left wing, the most left wing college in America. Right. Um, what I can say is if that's the most left wing college in America, they need help. Um, and it was full of um, very rich boys and girls. Mm -hmm. uh, so. I spent my four years complaining, really. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I didn't like a lot of them, uh, but it was a very good university. Uh, but I, I found I didn't have a lot in common with them. <laughs> right. And did you further degree after your, I'm assuming it's a Bachelor of Science? Or... Yeah. Um, I didn't, actually, Roger. Uh, some, in some ways, it's, it's one of the few things in life I look back and I think, oh, maybe I should have. Um, because not having, uh, I didn't go on um, to do a, a high degree. In some ways, I thought I should have, because not a, a, a PhD means that you, if you get in, into any kind of discussions with people, uh, they tend to assume that you don't know what you're talking about, which is very annoying. Okay, well, but I didn't, because um, what I enjoy is between things, you know, the borders between art and science, or the border between this science and that science. And I realized you couldn't do that in a PhD. Right. Um, you have to plow an established furrow, and I just didn't want to do that. So I didn't go on. Um, perhaps it was a mistake, but the job I've done since um, has suited me because it's all about making connections between things. So. Yeah. So, what, so you university. did your bachelor's degree, and I mean, obviously, in between. Right. So you you did your bachelor's degree, and what year yeah. did you graduate? Uh, 1985. I, mean, I have to say, I was at university at a dreadful time in America. Um, it, to be there during Reagan and Thatcher was just awful, and it was also the it was so libertarian and right wing. Mm -hmm. um, I was in endless arguments with people, but well, this supposedly left-wing college. Yeah. Well, it was left-wing, but left-wing in an American context. Right. Um, so, I mean, left-wing amongst fairly wealthy middle-class intellectual people, or their children, okay. uh, to me struck me as about I don't know, Lib Dem. Okay, this was quite good training for the Green Party then. I. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, um, between 1985 when you left uh, Swarthmore, um, that, that gives us seven years to the first documentary I've got you here listed in your biography. Um, yeah. What about the interregnum between, uh, you know, how does a, a graduate of uh, biological anthropology, whatever the mm. hell that is. I, I think. <laughs> um, I, I did. I have to confess, I did make that up. There is at the time there was no such thing as bioanthropology, but I quickly realised that 
how impressed people were with your made with you how impressive the name was i see so bioanthropology sounds very long and very impressive so yeah. okay well, th th there's a wikipedia article now about bio uh, biological no, anthropology excellent. so it's now a category <laughs> so <laughs> excellent but the, um, the, the, the time you're talking about, the first year after, after I graduated, I was a teacher. I was a teacher in America teaching fundamental biology for a year until they fired me. Um, uh, I taught in uh, an inner city school in a place called East Orange, and it was by far and away the hardest thing I've ever done. Uh, whenever I um, felt sorry for myself, I think back to that experience, and then I think, yeah, well, this is nothing. <laughs> where, where, where is East Orange? It's right next to Newark, Newark, New Jersey. And it is a, well, it was a truly horrible place. Very poor um, and just violent. And also that was the year that crack hit um, East Orange. I don't know about elsewhere, but that was the year I lost. I lost several kids to crack. Wow. Um, yeah. This was in um, 1986. 85, 86, 85, 86 yeah, that, that yeah. academic year, um, and yeah, it, they, they were, looking back, they were great kids, at the time it was really, really hard, I had no training as a teacher, I just went and did it, um, and yeah, it was very, very tough, it was all they could do to survive, never mind learn, um, um, what and age they group, did learn. What age group were you teaching? Uh, between 15 and 18, depending on how many times they repeated things. Um, my kids, I, you know, being the, in the department, I got to teach the, the, the lowest stream, or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. So the other teachers merrily referred to my kids as the animals. Oh. Mm -hmm. And they were tough. Mm -hmm. They were really tough kids, but they had really tough lives. Yeah. Um, and then, as I say, they fired me, so I did that for a year. Um, and then went back, came back home, I mean, back to Europe, tried to get all kinds of jobs, you know, got turned down a lot. Finally got uh, a job blasting in a tunnel in the Alps through friends. I have lots of friends in France. Mm -hmm. I lived there for quite a while. Um, and then um, almost back accident, got a job uh, at the BBC. I, I, I wasn't trying to get a job at the BBC. I was in contact with someone at the BBC asking for their help to put me in contact with some academics. Um, had a long conversation, and then the fellow said, um, by the way, do you want a job? By pure it. luck, I happened to be having this conversation at the time when the next week they wanted to recruit a researcher. Okay. And he said, and I, I applied and, I, and, and got the job. Yeah, but I have to say, until that point, I would have said, oh, I know that free will's rubbish. It's all predestined fate. Is this philosophical <laughs> point that you're making there, or...? Well, no, <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I, it does undermine your 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 feelings about free will when you find that you end up doing the same job as your dad and you never want, not for a, a nanosecond, ever wanted to. Yeah, mm -hmm. I know the feeling. Um, so, so you went back from America and you went to France. Then you dug a great big hole through the Alps. And well, uh, so, so this researching job. job was what was that in the yeah, late eighties? Right. Yeah, I, mean, I was just hired as a researcher, and you know, it, that was the very end of the old BBC. Um, the BBC changed from the old. Okay, BBC, so you were there at the there. time that um, Alistair Milne got the boot. Yeah, yeah, right. uh, and uh, it, it it was. Um, it was still there at the end. I was working for three different producers. They would come in and say, oh, find me the number of CT scanners in London. And someone else would say, find me, you know, the acreage uh -huh. that planted with this or that or the other. And I just did that. And then, of course, what happens is after you've done that for a while, one day someone comes in and says, oh, we need someone to do this short film. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, you. Yeah, you in the corner there. You do it. And off you go. Okay. So, so were mm -hmm. you in a, like a general news team, or was it attached to one of the, you know, a, a program we might have known about? I think. You, did you uh, well, it was a program which was on the air for I can't remember now four or five years called Antenna um, on BBC Two. It uh -huh. was a, um, a magazine program that ran two twenty-minute films and a ten-minute film, which was supposed to sort of be a complement to Horizon. Okay. And I, I, I worked on. That.
Antenna returns tomorrow and takes us into the world of chaos, a world where the most complex systems of global weather can be affected by the gentle fluttering of a butterfly's wing, and where the simplest systems defy predictability. A new series of Antenna begins tomorrow at 10 past 8 on BBC Two. And then I was sent for two, two punishment duties to Tomorrow's World. When I did very bad things, they would send me to Tomorrow's World. And that um, was a punishment? Well, it was for me. <laughs> and in fairness, Tomorrow's World didn't like me, um, although the editor was very tolerant. Um, I was not good news on Tomorrow's World, wasn't cut out for it. So I would get sent there, yeah. and then at some point I'd do something really dreadful. And then eventually I ended up in Horizon. Okay. So then that led into well, what I was doing career. Um, what, what, well, I, what, I went independent, yeah. What, what's, <laughs> your, what, what's your favourite of the different documentaries that, that you've made that are listed on Wikipedia or others? Well, the, the most political two that I made were which I, I, I like, um, was uh, the 30th anniversary of Horizon, which someone's just pirated and put up on um, YouTube, which was lovely after okay. all this year. Um, it's called Horizon's 30th anniversary, The Far Side. And the other one was called Icon Earth. And both of those films I got in a lot of trouble for and had to defend my job. of the blue earth by now you can see it everywhere i mean it jumps at you from billboards from t-shirts uh, from book covers the economy was uh, controlled by society it was embedded in social relations that's what it was if you control by society today the opposite is the case society has become a mere adjunct of the economy our, our, our prime minister is more than the else the managing director of britain inc we were in this crazy economy where you can multiply uh, figures on stock markets and computers uh, through speculation and futures trading uh, and never need to have done anything in, in the real material world. And with that kind of artificial creation of wealth, which is keeping the, the actual financial system on the run all the time, um, that system is now requiring more and more of the dismantling of the structures of material security that have been part of, of people's lives. In the new global economy where the wealth of nations is traded daily, security and stability no longer exist. Particularly ICON. Okay, will, will you tell us about ICON Earth? I mean, you've told me about that before. It's a very interesting yeah. story. ICON Earth, I made in 1996. I think it was 86. Basically, I was looking at the then GATT negotiations, you know, the, which was the, yeah. the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs. When we ratified that round, the Uruguay round, it gave birth to the World Trade Organization. Uh -huh. And I was appalled by it and wanted to do something against globalization. But being in the science department, they wouldn't let me. Yeah. So I then said, well, I know what. Um, I want to make a film about that the image of the blue planet, you know, the little blue planet, um, yeah. uh -huh. as a modern icon, like a religious icon. In other words, an image which tells a whole set of beliefs. And they were willing to commission that, although not the head of Horizon, it was commissioned over his head. Um, they controlled the BBC to commissioned it directly, which made me unpopular. Um, Who was that then? It wasn't Alan Yentob then, was it? Or... No, it was um, Michael Jackson. Okay. Um, and he, he liked my films. And um, so essentially, I did make a film uh, uh, warning about globalization, but in the, uh, under the camouflage of, of a thing about the Earth as a. So 
it was it was a it was a full on piece of propaganda, um, which I really liked. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah. I have a soft spot for that film. I really, I really like it, and um, had a fantastic interview with um, Teddy Goldsmith. Okay. So uh, he and he and um, Vanna Shiva basically lay out the problems that are now being discussed about globalization. Right, and Teddy Goldsmith is the pub was the publisher and founder of the Ecologist magazine. Yes, and, so James and, Goldsmith's and, brother, and uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, brother Zach, of Zach Nicole Goldsmith. Smith. The original corporate radar. Uncle. Right, yes. And yeah. Zach, yeah, Zach Goldsmith, um, uncle. Yeah, uh, yeah, famous from yeah. Richmond and the by election there, which we will probably get on to later. Yeah. Um, now, in that sort of context, you've already mentioned that you were s wanting to go to a left wing college. Um, mm. And uh, obviously, that's sort of some sort of nascent political. Uh, attitude sort of welling up there, I suppose. Um, sure. The gap... well, don't forget, my grandfather and my mother were both extremely political, so. Um... Well, I know you've told me before your mum was a Marxist, but your, your dad wasn't. Yeah. yeah. And my grandfather was a Marxist, who was an early member of the NUM and was a big influence on me when I was little. Mm hmm. Okay, and uh, what I'm trying to do is just in the timeline, because that's sort of 95, 96, you make Icon on Earth, and that's when GATS going on. Where does that mm. fit in with NAFTA? Did, did you see any of that stuff? The, um, yeah. the, the Perot and the uh, uh, Gore election? Uh, yeah. Where, 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 but, but... where Gore got beaten by Clinton, didn't he? Yeah. The problem is, don't forget, um, I was in the science department um, at the BBC, and then um, go around what I was hired for was making science, history, philosophy documentaries. Um, it was very difficult political. Um, and during that time, the time you're talking about, I was twice approached directly by both the head of... Um, Science at BBC and the then head at Channel 4 to make a film. They, they requested that I make the film, say, and you know, steady on, Roger, because I know what you're, you think about this, but they wanted me to make a film saying um, climate change is, um, uh, is a hoax, is a load of old rubbish, mm -hmm. which I refused um, okay. because. Um, at that time, I thought there was just no basis for making that claim. Um, but it, it, it clearly, I think, shows that there was a there was a political agenda within the mainstream um, um, broadcasters, which was had already made up its mind against um, um, a lot of environmental matters, but certainly anything to do with climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and as I said, it, it was difficult to, to do things that dealt with politics or finance. Um, the, the next one I, I managed to make was High Anxiety, which was um, the Mathematics of Chaos, and that was mm -hmm. 2008. 2008, yeah, I suppose it was. I lose track of what was when. Um, and, and that was very definitely about the, the financial crisis that I could see coming. Yeah, I um, mean, that's. But again, I had to hide that that's what it was about under mathematics. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, and it was. I mean, you know, it's not that I lied to the broadcasters. I always did deliver the thing I said I would, but I also tried to get it to do the thing that I wanted it to do at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, the, um, and that film was broadcast. We actually broadcast the day after Lehman Brothers went down. But there, so I was definitely, whatever, whatever you think the merits or demerits of the film were, I was on the money. Um, and I, 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 I clearly said this is going to happen at a time when all the all of the mm -hmm. the, the um, financial reporting and all of the current affairs people were looking the other way. Yeah. And once that went out, I then said to them, "Look, I was on the money. I've got another film I'd like to make in this area. Can I make it?" To which the reply was, um, "No, you're a science banner act. Leave this to the big boys at current affairs." Right. 
Because I, I, you know Charles Ferguson, don't you? Who made the Oscar-winning f- film um, about yeah. that crisis? Mm-hmm. Um, it was an inside job he made, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, it's funny because the film against climate change that's been made several times and was made, at, you know, yeah. uh, around that time. I, I think Channel Four did make it, didn't they? The uh, the Great Global the great Warming Swindle, swindle yeah. I think that one's called. The Great Global Warming Hoax or something. Yeah, I think it's called The Great Warm, uh, Global Warming Swindle. Um, oh, right, so, th- th- that, that time is when we kind of get to know you in the, you know, the monetary reform, refugees yeah. from the financial crisis, including myself. I mean, I came yeah. across you in 2011 on, on the right, Gollum yeah. blog. Uh, many viewers will know you from the Gollum blog. So how did the Gollum blog happen and the uh, Debt Generation book? Um, in the same sort of way that, that, that getting into television happened by accident. I, I wish I could claim to have been a, you know, a man of enormous foresight and great planning, but it wouldn't be true. Um, I was just started writing um, as a putting comments in the online Guardian, you know, under under the articles, mm-hmm. um, uh, and I just did that uh, because I was outraged by what I saw going on. Because w- once the crisis started unfolding, I could just tell there was something that smelled bad. There was a huge gap between what I could see going on and the official story. So all I did in being frustrated with the, the official stories, I went to the, the boards where day traders talk to each other, and there's, there's a whole bunch of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and m- most of what they write is, is a bit impenetrable if you're not a trader, you know, mm-hmm. invest, at, you know invest at 30 with a stop out at 35 and there's something at 22 and you know, you think, well, it's... but in between times, they talk to each other about what they think is happening. Now, most of those people were to the right of Genghis Khan. They were mostly American, mostly really quite right-wing libertarians. So politically, I wouldn't have a lot in common with them. But what was quickly obvious is the analysis that they made between them when they were saying, what do you think is going on, was often, was usually really accurate. Um, And I I realized that it was honest, even to the point where the points that they were making argued against their own political ideology, mm-hmm. for the simple reason that they couldn't afford to lie to themselves. Yes. Because whatever their analysis was, they were going to bet their own money the next day. Yes. Yeah. And the more I read it, the more it just diverged. There was the official story, and there was what was happening, and the, the, the day traders were on it. Yeah. Uh, and so I, re- I, I, I read that stuff. Um, and got more and more outraged by the sort of concerted campaign of disinformation. You know, Uh everybody, every single um, pundit who was ever wheeled on, you know, from Stephanie Flanders on down, they all said, it's it's just a a liquidity crisis. And the traders could clearly see this was not a liquidity crisis, this was a solvency crisis. Uh And therefore, they shorted things, and some of them made an absolute fortune. So I just started writing that stuff. Um, I wrote a lot, and um, over the time, various people uh, became quite well known in that little that little world. And mm-hmm. they said, "Start writing a blog." I, I said no a couple of times because I, I, I didn't fancy it. Um, um, but once people have asked you enough, it starts to become rude to say no. And I thought, "Oh, all right, well, sod it, I will." And so well, then I started writing the blog. Out well, of the blog, then uh, an old friend of mine had read it and said, can I turn this into a book, please? Uh-huh. I was flattered and pleased, and, and he did. Yeah. So although it's got my name on that book, and I wrote the words, I really didn't do any of the work he did. Okay. Mark well, that book actually has a very good website, The Debt Generation, with some mm. really nice readings of... of some of the the blogs that that you read that are embedded in there and it's embedded on your candidate website as well I, I, yeah. there's, a, there's a page with that there if, if people 
want to go and have a look at that it, it's quite easy to find on David's candidate website um, in the beginning of uh, Gollum X1 you were pretty prolific they're, they're, you were writing watching from the uh, um, progressive momentum uh, blog mm -hmm. um, you'll know Bill on. Hello, uh, Bill. We, yeah, well, uh, Bill, Bill's uh, trailed the interview on his website and had been a writer. And Bill's question to you is, when are you going to start blogging again? You know, even mm. just once a month, you know, your, yeah. I, th I yeah, think the no, quote no, I, is, your public demands. Yeah, I feel bad, Bill. I do. Um, it's a combination of events. Um, there the, have the, been quite a number of really tough things that have happened at home, which has just meant that I, I, I didn't have the, um, it's more emotional um, horsepower, more than mental, and, and that's put a big dent in things. But, I, and, and I'd say that's, in some ways, that's the main thing. But, but the other big part of it is, um, so little has changed in the nature of the crisis that, I often think I, I should write about this, and I think the same thing four, four or five times. You know, with oh. the, the 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 things which the banks and the central banks and the politicians are doing, and the and the phrases they're using, they're just doing the same thing over and over and again. And how many times can you can you say, look, the banks that they're propping up, are, they're not just. It's not a liquidity crisis, it's a solvency crisis. Some of these banks are still insolvent. How, how many times can you say, look, how can they, they have still bad debts after all this time? How can a Spanish bank or a Landis bank, or, but the Spanish banks are a better example, suddenly go down a few weeks ago on the basis of bad debts that were made 10 years ago, some of them? Mm -hmm. how, how is that possible? Yeah. And of course, we, we, you know, I've, I've written about it several times. It's just, you know, you, the old loan is is not being paid and is going to expire. So you just roll it into a new loan, and suddenly yes. the new loan is up to date. And when that one gets a bit behind, you put it into another new loan. Yeah. And and you know, the talk about aus austerity, it's the same mantras just repeated and repeated and repeated. And I, and I think to myself, can I really just refute this or take issue with it again? Yes. Yeah. Um, and so, I, 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 I want to write something new rather than just repeat myself. But apart from that excuse, I mean, you're right, Bill. I should write. Um, um, I oh. just feel that just making the same criticisms of the same idiots um, is difficult to to gear yourself up to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Because they I, are the same idiots. I, I think your, the same your analysis is so incisive and memorable, and it explains things in an accessible way. Um, yeah. I, well, that's nice I, I, I think we do know that a lot of the politicians that trot out their sort of pieties uh, are, are clueless, genuinely. They, they don't know. Like a number of them probably do think that the magic money tree doesn't exist. Um, <laughs> yeah, so. you're right. Some of them are just genuinely useful idiots. Um, and the ones that do know what's going on either benefit from it or um, are too afraid to say anything. Yeah. I mean, when I started reading your blog, um, it was the righteous anger that, that I really mm. identified with. And you know, talking about people's pension provisions, people's, uh, uh, you know, the austerity and benefit sanctions, yeah. uh, you know, when, when the Tories came in and headed off a recovery at the pass with austerity and mm. the EU doing the same thing. Now, you and I call those sorts of policies neoliberal. Um, yeah. I mean... For the viewers, um, would, would would you explain what your understanding is of the? We were talking about left wing and right wing libertarians and the American approach. Uh, can you explain yeah. something of, of how you read that that political ideology, which seems to be everywhere, 
you know, Tony Blair is yeah, no different see, to Margaret Thatcher yeah, It's and a good question. The, the, the problem is, although you and I, would, in the short ta- her hand, will call it um, neoliberal, I know what I mean by that, and it, I've, expound, I've explained it through the blog, but the problem is um, people on the left, will look at this at the way the, the crisis is being managed and say this is a, a neoliberal disaster mm-hmm. this is a disaster cooked up in the private banks unregulated private banks the people the, the people on the right neoliberals will look at the disaster and say this is a keynesian left-wing disaster mm-hmm. on the grounds that um, governments have been intervening massively and taking from their point of view printing up money, taking on debt, and pumping government money in to no avail. And so each of them wants to see that the problem is in the other camp. The libertarians want to see the problem is with the government and and government intervention and the Keynesian model, you know, government. Uh And the the people on the left say, no, no, want to see it as a libertarian, uh, an unregulated. And the problem is, in some ways, they're both right and both wrong. But those who want to just not rather than get to the bottom of the problem just want to fly the flag for their side and blame it on the other they can get locked and i I think they are locked in this pointless combat um because the 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 libertarians are well sorry the the left wing is, is right that this was a problem and still is a problem of the private sector, the private banks, private financial institutions, um, taking, extending loans that were never going to be repaid, uh, and saddling themselves with debts which would blow them up, and then saying, "We're so big, if you let us blow up, the world, the sky will fall in, and you must bail us out." So the left wing is right that that's the nature of the problem. It is unregulated um, private sector; they created it. There wasn't a vast out of control public spending in 2008. No, UK debt to GDP in 2008 was 43 percent, which was historically low and hadn't been going up. It's a small increment. By 2013, our debt to GDP was 86 percent. It had doubled. Well, it, it wasn't that the, the, the left wing government had gone on a spending binge, giving nurses 5,000 percent increases in salary. What had happened is we spent 1.4 trillion bailing out private banks and saving their their private bondholders from having to take the loss that they should have taken. Yeah. But the but the right wingers, the libertarians are right that we have had a series of governments, left and right, pumping vast amounts of, of, of public money in, which they've raised through um, taking on debt, public debt. And they have pumped it in, and so that does look like the right wing are, are right that it's, a, it's the government response has been fatuous. What they what they miss is the fact that um, pumping public money in isn't necessarily a bad thing. But what Keynes never said, what Keynes said is you must you, you, the government can intervene when the when the the private sector fails and put money in to keep the the wheels turning. But what he says is you've got to put it in in an economically productive way. And that's what our governments haven't done. They haven't put it in in any kind of economically productive way. They could have spent that money um, in promoting small and medium enterprises. But they didn't. They shoved it into moribund banks where it disappeared and did no economic good at all. Yeah. I and think, so it's... Yeah. I, I, I don't want to see it as a left versus right problem because both sides have been utterly fatuous yes. and, and have missed the point. I it, think it, at this point, if I can just interject, I mean, your blog sure. has a very large constituency of MMTers, and I have a lot of respect sure. for MMTers, even though I've yeah, had me too. political differences with them. Um, then there are the positive moneyers, the honest yeah. moneyers. Um, Money is a construct which most people think they understand, but don't. Mm. And uh, I think on your blog, um, there are plenty of 
posts of your own and then other help. I, I think you mentioned Positive Money back in quite in the early days of Positive Money. I, re I reviewed the book when it first came out. Yeah. Um, so, in terms of that question, yeah. um, I mean, if we sort of give the shout out to Mosla, Mitchell, um, and then Steve, Steve Keen, Keen, who's working, kind of yeah. in the middle. And then uh, the positive money, and uh, which is Ben Dyson's lot, and uh, yeah. uh, Fran Botan. I think it's Fran Botan is the new head of research there. Mm -hmm. And people like Professor Richard Werner, and uh, yeah. they're, they're all there. Um, but people watching you as the green candidate for the green leadership, if we move on to the green leadership now, mm. um, one of your points was the Green Party doesn't seem to know anything about economics and finance and if it does it doesn't talk about it so yeah, can we yeah. dive well, I mean there are people in the Green Party party who know quite a lot about it but when it's given no prominence it's 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 not given a lot of prominence in um, our manifesto it certainly wasn't the last one and it's not something that that we that our leadership Puts at the forefront of of what a, of what green politics is about, and I think that's a mistake. I mean, my feeling has always been that no party is going to be able to deliver on the promises it makes you in election year unless they can run and control the economy, or yeah. at least run the economy. And we certainly won't deliver on saving the environment unless we first regain democratic some semblance of democratic control over our um, economy i think these things are inextricably bound and therefore i think it's wrong and just silly to talk about all the things we want to do mm -hmm. without making it absolutely dead center of what people think about when they hear the word green we we, we have to make uh, our economic and financial policies and our economic and financial understanding absolutely central. Otherwise, people think we're a party with a lovely wish list of things, but the same way that, um, you know, my kids could have a lovely wish list of things, you know, the, the, the list you write for Father Christmas. You have no idea how Father Christmas is ever going to deliver these things, but you write the list, number one, number two, number three, number four, and, and I find that a huge... Yeah. Well, it problem. helps to know about and the magic. I'd just like to say about the positive money and MMT, I've never gotten into the middle, I've refused to get into the middle of the of the kind of the tribal warfare that goes on. I understand that there are differences, and I understand, I think, some of those differences. But the main insights that they share are the important thing. Yes, and I do I sometimes that. despair that it becomes a little bit like Monty Python. Yes. yes. Yeah. People's Liberation Front of Palestine. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah, MMT. Ah. Yeah. Yeah. Passions run high. You don't need yes. to. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, backing back to 2015, um, yeah. you did say uh, in the 2016 leadership campaign that you fully expected there to be another election coming up. Um, yeah. The 2015 manifesto got me interested in the Green Party. I'd never been interested in it before. Um, mm. How did a party that produced one of the most radical reforming manifestos of the second half of the 21st century, including the Labour 45, um, mm. throw out the garbage which I felt the 2017 manifesto was? It was lightweight, woolly, and it didn't have the all-important policy EC661, which was the... Uh, taking yeah. back the, the, the creation of money um, process into into public administration if you know if not yeah. like a, a you know a, 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 a kind of a cross balance committee sort of thing uh, yeah. how did that happen what, what 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 is happening with what happened with consultation under Natalie Bennett that didn't happen under the yeah. Bartley Lucas regime yeah. Well, I can't give you, you know, the inner workings. I, you know, don't forget, I don't live in London. I'm not part of GPEX, you know, the, 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 the executive. Um, I live in Scarborough and I'm not, um, although, the, although the people, in, those people, the leadership know me, 
I'm not on the Christmas card list and I'm not pals with them or anything. So I don't know from the inside. What I do know is a couple of things. One, there's been a long, long effort on behalf of some uh, a group of people to get that policy about monetary reform and taking the power of money creation away from the banks. It had taken a long time to get that passed. It was a big struggle. Um, and many people in the Green Party, it got passed, but without a lot of people in the Green Party really understanding the significance of it. Who's now on the um, monetary um, uh, study group, um, X, uh, Bank of England. Um, I, I don't know him. By all accounts, he's very good in, on lots of things, but he's very much against that policy because he he takes a very old-fashioned view of what money is, and and you know therefore he he thinks austerity is necessary and all the rest mm -hmm. of it. And so there's been a kind of a pulling back um, on those committees from that. Um, uh, the policy and that radical policy, which I think is a massive mistake, mm -hmm. given that there was that that pullback and the fact that that I think at the national level for uh -huh. the election it took them by surprise. That didn't help. I mean, I, I told no, my, I told my local party on the day of uh, the count that we had, I said, 18 months to get ready for the next election. So I was uh -huh. a bit off. Well, well you were, you, you, were press, you, you you were. You know, it was, yeah, it, it you, seemed very, you very made a pretty good shout. Another election, and, and I said it would be. I, I thought it would be um, uh, Theresa and Boris, um, but the other way around. Mm -hmm. I thought I actually thought Boris would be the leader and Theresa May would be Home Secretary, and it turned out the other way around. Um, well, he's a devout. But, liberal, was, liberal, but isn't uh, uh, to, just to finish off, the last yeah. thing is that our present leadership have a very different set of concerns. So had they had a, a, a focus on um, on the importance of getting get democratic control back, if they saw the lack of democratic control as an important thing, I think they would have, then the uh, they would have pushed a more radical um, manifesto like 2015, but that wasn't their focus. They weren't focused on particularly on the TTIP, um, I and others pushed that, and, and it sort of, but it was a push we had to make. That wasn't the focus. The focus of our present leadership has always been anti Brexit, um, pro immigration, um, anti racist, and identity politics. Now, I'm not saying that that's what got spoken about the most. Um, and so I don't think that they would have noticed particularly that. that the radical parts of our financial stuff had dropped away, and they they didn't. I mean, I, I personally disappointed that it was Corbyn who who spoke most forcefully about um, um, about austerity and um, the banks being too big to fail and too big to prosecute. I was really cheered that he did, but disappointed that it wasn't us at the forefront of that. Well, and John McDonnell as well, who who has taken some yes. advice from some, uh, like Richard Murphy, for instance. Yeah, good man. Uh, who who's a very good writer on um, monetary he economics. Stuff, yeah. He does know his stuff. Um, you've been interviewed by Real Media, who also interviewed him, and I recommend mm -hmm. you know to our viewers that yeah, Real they, Media, I think, are very good. They take a look at the Real I Media. You know, they don't see eye to eye on everything, but I like them. Yeah. And well, they've interviewed David Graeber as well, of course, who wrote Dead mm -hmm. First Five Thousand Years, which um, yeah. So I mean, we do need to get to grips with what it isn't, and and I, I I do think if the Green Party doesn't, if if ever that policy of taking control of the money creation away from the private banks, if if we lose that, then well, it's a matter um, of political pedagogy, really, David, and and your writing yeah. is so brilliant. Uh, illuminating these sort of dark corners of, of stuff, mm. you know. The, the thing, thing that bothers me is, amongst many, is the, the, the endless stuff about have you costed this um, uh, policy? Have you, have you got a balanced budget? Uh, and um, I'm not saying that you shouldn't have any idea of what your policies might cost, but the notion that 
you've got to come out with a balance sheet with all your policies and what they'll cost and your income, and it comes to a grand bing, zero, zero expenditure, balanced budget, mm. is cobblers. This notion that um, the government shouldn't have debt. I mean, never mind whether a government should fund itself through the sale of debt or not, which I obviously think they shouldn't, and there's no reason for them, mm -hmm. but let's suppose that they do, mainstream economists will go, oh my God, you can't have a government just really nearly printing up debt and, and just make, increasing the money supply because you'll end up like, um, like Weimar Germany, they'll say. And yet, the same people who say that, it never even occurred to them. They have no problem with the private banks printing up money and debt out of nothing. Yeah, well, and you think, wait a minute, yeah. why is it why will the sky fall on our head if a government prints up money? But it's a fabulous thing if the private banks print up money. Which is what they do. They they print up debt. Why is it okay for them to print up debt but not governments? It, it, it just seems to me that there's a basic failure to engage clearly with the the most basic part of the political problem. Yeah, well, it's ideological. We know that. It's 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 it's, 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 it's not a necessary condition of any political argument that that should be so. It's a it, 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 it's a matter it of faith. But doesn't you, Roger, that that we have an army of highly paid so-called experts and pundits on writing for newspapers and on our televisions, and they don't question it. Well, they're priests. They, I they, mean, they, they, I, they I mean, all of yeah. this assumption. Um, the same without, army exists. They are pushing an agenda, and their job is not to think critically or to push the bounds of knowledge. Their job is to peddle the official narrative which yeah, well, the we're Green Party all can't to... afford to, to go along with it. The Green Party can't afford to accept those assumptions in its when, when we talk about politics. Uh, we have to, because if we accept the assumptions, then we lose. Wins the argument. Mm -hmm. So we have to say, look, 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 hang on a second, your, your starting assumption is simply wrong. And get them to answer, why is it fine for banks to create money out of nothing and to rack up debt, issue debt, but the same amount issued by a government, you're saying the sky would fall on our heads. How does that work? Just explain that for me first, Mr. Radio 4. Well, they define the Go boundary on. limits as well of the discussion, which, you know, anyone that knows anything about algorithms know that the boundaries are very important. It's mm. not just the starting point, but, you know, also the boundaries within which you yeah, make the predictions. You but that's um, what the Green Party has to do. I truly believe that. If we don't do that, we're, we're a, a pressure group on the boundary. Well, I don't want to be a pressure group. I don't think the country needs a pressure group on the boundary. This, this nation, I firmly believe, desperately needs a, green, a radical Green Party to be an electable party, a party that people think, if they were voted into power, they would know how to run the country. Okay. What they don't want to know is they're a country that knows how to play by the sidelines. Yeah. Well... What I think a lot of people struggle with, particularly like me, I, I mean, I sat on the fence on Brexit, and then as things developed in the States, it became better and better. But right now, um, I think it's still going to be fine. Um, and a neoliberal EU, why be in it? I mean, you don't want to be out of it with a more neoliberal government than they've got. But the choice was you know, uh, fascism under May or fascism under the EU in the sense that May was like General Franco and <laughs> Mr Juncker's like Stalin. And, and, and well, I, I, I partly agree with you. I mean, I, I was in favour of Remain. Um, but my the argument that I made at the time was it's not about what you might want to leave, but what you'll be left with. H had we been... Had had we had um, a Corbyn-like government, then I would have probably voted for. I can, un but I, I didn't want to have to leave the EU and have an un um, uh, an unopposed, unfettered, globalist, right-wing government. I I, I, I agree with have. you, uh, but I agree with you 
a lot of the reasons for staying in the EU, and there were many I could I listed at the time, a lot of them were legacy things. You know, all the stuff about um, environmental protection, worker protection, phytosanitary protection, they were all from the golden age of the EU. And if you had been in, and, you know, for, for those of us who were in the TTIP fight, the big fight against the big trade agreement, in that fight, the, the enemy, the people pushing, absolutely pushing for the dismantling and the, the selling off of all those protections, yes. was the EU. Yeah. Let's they just, were the ones. Can we look who, at that? You know, we had the document saying, well, we're, we're, you know, looking, uh, getting the submissions. And, um, and people like Malmstrom were liars. They were yeah. consistently lying and misrepresenting yeah. things. So if you were in that fight, you, mm. it was very difficult to look at the EU and say, well, these will be other people that will save us from a, 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 a horrible yeah. um, Tory government. Okay. Well, <laughs> TTIP is dead for now, but CETA... Only for now. Yeah. It's like the undead. Unless you've well, shot it in the head, yeah. it will suddenly but stand C back up. But CETA after. is upon us and real. And you yes, had the yes, Wallonian uh, delay... Uh, then they got it through the Parliament, didn't they? Yeah, and CETA is a disaster, uh, and, uh, and TISA is coming after it. Now it's out to the different countries to pass, except the European Court of Justice passed the ruling about mm -hmm. trade deals not needing to be granted by yes. the countries outside. Yes. A, um, a, have you been following mine, that one at all? Um, I mean, I must confess I've not been following it that closely. Sorry, I... So, have you been following that one, David? Because I'd quite like yeah, to know. Yeah. So, so what's going to happen with that? Is it going to be something which Britain is bound to it, it, after Brexit? Well, assuming we, Brexit we will happens? be bound to it under the, under the, um, the um, what do they call it, the Twilight Clause or whatever it is, Sunset Clause. Um, yeah, we will be bound to it as far as I can see. And the, the thing about the law surrounding that is they are essentially making it as they go along. Mm -hmm. Um, as far as I can see, we will be bound by that. Um, and there's a, I think it's a seven year, I think, I think they call it a sunset clause or something. Um, so yeah, I think we will be yeah. bound by that. Yeah. Assuming it goes through and there isn't some sort of challenge to the anti-democratic way of, I mean, it's the EU's answer to everything is if people look like they're going to vote against it, just don't get them to vote. Just take or if they vote the wrong way, get them to do it again. The Irish can tell you about that. Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. So, so <laughs> why, why is the Green leadership saying, you know, well, come on, let's get back in there? It, it's uh, the 2015 well, manifesto uh, yeah, had a policy for a referendum. I'm thinking, as I did, this is a disaster. Um, um, at least there are um, safeguards in Europe um, which they haven't dismantled yet and, may, and won't be able to dismantle as easily as they can dismantle things that are just UK law. Do, do you Could I, I think it probably is true, but it's... It's, it's a vain um, hope, I would say. Weak argument, I think. I'm should be reformed, and I I live in Sweden. I think Sweden does Europe really quite well, but the Swedes yeah. can do consensus, and British people like you and I, well, you're an Englishman, I'm a Welshman. We don't do consensus terribly well. It's not really in us uh, yeah. because we want to get on. Well, my, you know, I, I, tell you, I mean, I, I I what's worried me most about the the fallout from from Brexit hasn't been the specifics. What's saddened me and worried me for the future is um, what I see as a righteous intolerance mm -hmm. on both sides of the uh, of the debate. That it's it's an intolerance of the other person's position, but based on a sense of righteousness. And it, it reminds me of nothing so much as the ca the, ref the Counter Reformation, where it wasn't enough to disagree with the other side. You, you couldn't just say, well, let's agree to disagree, because the other side was about to bring down the wrath of God, and so it was fine to slaughter them. Yes. And yeah. it's that kind of righteous intolerance uh, which I see as a rising kind of 
poisoning of our political discussion, which I find very, well, if, very. If I may say, I mean, I, I think the Green Party is very good at that sort of righteous witch hunting, as you know, some part in some terms part. of burning people for climate change denial. And I mean, I think a party that talks of climate beliefs, which Caroline regularly does, mm. is actually in the realms of. Cult, you know, it's it's in the realms of being a cult and a personality cult. Well, you know, we, we disagree about the about about, well, about the climate, climate change, business. but perhaps the. But but I do I, I I I don't think the Green Party is. I wouldn't want to say the Green Party is more guilty than anybody else, but it's there in the Green Party. It's there in the country in in in, in every. Um, I, I in mean, every our party, other parties, as we discussion. said, just the tenor of the times has become righteously intolerant. I don't like it. David, I mean, our other our other parties as misanthropic as the green, as as the radical green. By misanthropic, you mean the sort of well, embrace doesn't survive nature. Yeah, either. I often see comments like, "Oh, what a terrible species we are, and we yeah. deserve everything we get. Oh, we are absolutely." All. I well, happen I mean, to think the human I race is a beautiful species. There are people like species. that in the Green Party, and um, um, there are people like that. Um, in, in other parties, uh, it's not a very helpful kind of thing. It, 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 those comments, I think, are just people who aren't looking for a way forward. Um, hmm. But um, I, mean, I think say in the Green Party, it's counterbalanced by a lot of other good things. I mean, I, I would rather have the misanthropy or the misanthropy, however you say it, that you find in the Green Party than the out-and-out -out callousness of the Tories. Um, yeah, well, I mean, no doubt it is there, and it, it exists in the Labour Party too. I mean, there are there are callous people of all political shades and colours, and there are there are there are very nice people I, in all I, of those I, parties. I which is our problem? I think our our problem is an very very difficult debate, and uh, 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 I I think this is kind of a systemic, which I think is is hurting us. I mean, I. I would you say that debating the Green Party is more binary than it ought to be for a correct sort of pedagogical approach to a scientific matter such as climate change? I, I, I don't know, to be honest. What, what it offers, we don't have... I, I don't see as much debate going on as I'd like and... and um, like leadership, it's, it's, it's Would difficult. you debate, um, say, Piers Corbyn about climate change? I mean, we could host a, a thing, and you two could discuss climate change. And and uh, he he's a, 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 you know, a full on what 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 you would call denier. What I would. Call I'm not a, sure. Uh, is he a denier? I think he just says that there are different. There are there are different he, elements, he, and, he, and he, he, there are uncertainties he, in places he, where some scientists pretend there aren't. I, I think that Piers feels that the CO2 AGW hypothesis has been proven, has been falsified by evidence already. Mm, um, okay, that's I the CO2 thing. I mean, that, really that doesn't mean that there isn't global warming. There's a paper just out um, which is saying that the pause is actually real. The the uh, All the debunking of that has come back and bit them in the arse, basically. Um, and uh, the, the pause is actually even Michael Mann, the famous hooky, the hockey stick man, has, has apparently mm. uh, begrudgingly admitted that it's less than optimal in there. Oh, but I mean, there's no doubt about that. The, the, the model... Yeah, but I, the pause think, is the thing, David. I think it, 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 when it, scientists it's... got pushed into pretending they were more certain about more accurate than they were, perhaps for, for what they felt was good, I think that was a mistake. Would be much better to say, look, the models do have problems, and um, there are areas in the models which are really unknown. I think it'd be much better to be honest about that. Um, yeah, I, well, I mean, the East Anglia thing I genuinely was think swept that under the, the carpet very quickly. Not, is not wrong, and that the that the risks of taking the other view that saying, well. Because we're not really sure about this, we should pretend that we should just say, well, maybe we don't need to act on it. I think that's wrong. 
Well, I, Someone, I, I saw a, 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 a cartoon which I quite like, which I can't reproduce for you, but essentially it said, imagine what a lower energy using, lower polluting, um, more economically just world, because we thought that this would be the answer to uh, climate change, and then found that we hadn't needed to because climate world wasn't, wasn't true. Wouldn't that be dreadful? Well, yes, it would be dreadful, but I mean, one has to, <laughs> you know, to do the right yeah, thing. If one models reason. climate, one deals in probabilities, and and the, sure. the, the 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 probabilities of some of the uh, downsides of creating fuel poverty, while while um, there's no need to create fuel poverty. Yeah, well, uh, there's no need. To, that's one of the problems of of the of of the way. Particularly, I think that um, big money global corporate responses are that they that their solutions might create things like fuel poverty or temperature poverty. I, I'm happy for people to use less fuel as long as they're still warm and can cook their dinner. Um, I, I don't think there's any need for solutions. To create those problems, I think if you're offered solutions that do create those problems, you need to ask yourself, why is this person offering me this rubbish solution? And usually it would be because it's rubbish for you, but we'll earn them money. Well, the rubbish solutions which I see coming, a lot of them come from the Green Party. Um, and you cannot, mm. I've been banned from various discussion groups in the Green Party for being a you know, so called climate denier. I mean, as if well, I, I would deny true. a climate. I mean, you know, if it's, it, I mean, you know, the climate exists. Who's denying that there's a climate? I mean, it, sure. it, it's just such a specious argument. It, it really is. I, I find it quite frustrating the mm. lack of the lack of knowledge in discourse and. The but that's, that, 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 in fairness, that's always going to be the, the, the case that in any party, a, a, a lot of the people in the party are not going to be experts. They learn and people who they think know more. I mean, most people in the Labour Party are not experts on supply and demand of labour and how the economy works. Well, well, but they just except that, that we've know. got Caroline saying and criticising the Queen's speech, not enough climate change. Uh, criticising the debates in the election debates, not enough about climate change. Well, well I think that was true, Roger. I think, I think it, it was... It, it talked about. I mean, in, in the, the election was notable. Do, I mean, for, do, you, do you think if it had been talked about more, the Green Party would have got more votes? Because I doubt it somehow. I think the vote would have collapsed more out there now, where yeah. well, scepticism is actually a valid Roger. point of view. Yeah, it's a separate debate, I think. I mean, I, I've gone on record for saying I think sometimes we talk too... Um, we, we, we reach too readily for talking about the environment when we're talking to people, and uh, which sounds counterintuitive, but the, 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 the light-hearted quip I, I make is if you were in bed on Sunday, there was a loud knock at the door, you tramp down in your dressing gown feeling grumpy, and there's the Pope at the door, having got you out of bed early, and he said, did you know I was a Catholic? Mm. You might be a little bit pissed off and think to yourself, he got me out of bed to tell me what I know, why don't you talk about something you don't know? I think most people know that we, A, are very concerned about all kinds of environmental matters, and know quite a lot about them, and have people in the party who know a lot about them, talking about the things that people don't know about us. Do we know how to run the rest of a country to pay for, to in, to legally do all the things that we want to do? That's what I think we should be talking about. But as, yeah. as far as the the um, uh, election, the last couple of elections, the, there was, from the other parties, it was clear that the environment was still not on their agenda in any way, shape or form. In this last election, you're right, if we, if we talked a lot about the environment, it, it wouldn't have, have it wouldn't have helped our vote. Well, our vote, I, I, our vote going up and down had nothing fracking, to do with. Fracking, I, I think that's been dropped now, even by Theresa May, which is great because uh, fracking is crap. 
you know, there's lots of evidence of that. So, so people like Louise Raspberry, she's brilliant. You know, they for the frackers. Yeah. That's well, and you've written about is. that in the states as well, and it's it's founded on debt bubbles and you know pump and dumps and you know the theory of the great is, fall. It, it, it's a deeply, price. deeply dishonest technology, and the, the whole the whole um, politics around it is. It pollutes and it's awful. I mean, it's it's absolutely terrible. And but but I mean, for, for, uh, just. I, a little while ago, and you know, it, it, the, the the people who are talking about fisheries and pollution of the sea, they were saying, you know, it's still amazing how people still treat the ocean as if it was just an infinite sink. Mm. You know, in in all of their discussions, they were saying, you know, talking about all kinds of people. Once they say, and then we'll put it in the sea, it's as if, oh, and it's yeah. gone. I, I think the Green Party has become <laughs> and that's intellectual. That's precisely what the frackers it, are saying. Yes, yeah. I know there'll be hundreds of millions of gallons of polluted water but we put it in the sea yeah the, the green party is intellectually lazy on the environment that's my criticism there's so much that they could be saying and are not saying and they fall back on denier denier and maybe, by maybe. Um, I, I, so, you know i know it's a big i know it's a big thing for you i i, I think well, I, the environment is a huge it, thing for me. I'm a confirmed tree hugger. The Green hugger. Party, I think, is a lot less lazy than any other party, let's put it that way. At least, uh, it, it, I think if the Green Party didn't exist, the other It's a very low would, bar. Would, would, would I mean, I'll forward. give you I'll, I'll give you that. But w one thing I find interesting about the Green Party, and I've heard you say it yourself, is we're the only ones that, or, you know, we're the only ones that care, or we're the only ones that can. And, mm. I mean, I... Those sorts of general statements are never true. I mean, in logic, you can't. It, it's just not su uh, sustainable. It makes people feel better, but I just yeah. end up cringing, thinking, "Oh my goodness me!" You know, how how could anyone say that? Because well, it's, it's mean, never if, true. If that's all you say, I agree with you. But I think it's it, it it's. I would say that it's it's a true thing to say that the the Green Party, along with Friends of the Earth and Greenpeace. Um, have dragged the other parties very unwillingly um, um, into having to talk about these things. Um, I think the danger is thinking that that's enough, that that's our job. I mean, it, it, after this election, there have been, you know, okay, it doesn't matter so much that our, our vote collapsed because our job is to be there at the cutting edge and to drag the other parties um, uh, to, 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 to drag the political discussion towards these more, um, the, the things that they, the other parties won't discuss. If that's all the party is, then we don't need to exist, because Greenpeace and Friends of the Earth can do it. And, and, and that's not what the country needs. The country needs a radical party that can yeah. um, I, I agree with that. Let, let's and, talk. And, and if we lose sight of that, then there's no point for us, really. Okay, well, let's move on to proportional representation then, because, again, the big <laughs> chance for that was, what, 2012, which the Lib Dems got for their ill-fated coalition. The turnout was abominable. Mm. I, I, it wasn't the easiest voting system in the world to... And, again, it wasn't pushed by the establishment because they didn't want it. So it's sure. yet another dishonest campaign mm. by, by establishment politicians on all sides yeah um, but what is about the green party that doesn't participate in its own democracy and was it 47 percent or 38 percent turnout in the leadership election amazing and an online yeah. vote and 38 percent of people vote or, or whatever yeah. it was it was very low yeah well i mean i I think the point you raise is a good one in the sense that if if the Green Party is a is a party that you know says we're, we're people who understand that people want to vote and if they're given the right things to vote and a system where their vote counts they will vote then our election is not a great advert. Oh, um, it so. does suggest that. Um, and a failure to mobilise the uh, vote for a, something. A better voting system 
you know, which we have, we have PR, um, isn't the case. Now, if that was the case, if it was an automatic thing, then there'd be a 100% or at least a 90% turnout in the Green Party leadership election. And as you say, it wasn't. It was a 30-something percent vote. And, and so, so the other side of that as well is the, the Green Party saying, oh, let's lower the voting age, which I disagree with. I don't... I, I, I okay, would raise the voting many, age to There's too many things 20. going on here. I mean, um, um, yeah, I, I, I um, am not convinced that lowering the voting age from 18 to 16 is a good idea. Um, I certainly don't think it's a, it's a, it's a cure-all, um, because I know some 16-year-olds who are intelligent, incisive, and would make good voters. Um, I know others who are um, irresponsible, um, ignorant, stupid, and would make dreadful voters. And, and, and what I see is that um, it's not that people start out at 16 being wonderfully intelligent, incisive, um, and responsible, and some point in their 60s, all of that dies and they become irresponsible, selfish idiots are there at 16, and the 86-year-old irresponsible selfish idiots were probably selfish idiots when they were 16. Yeah, well, I plan so, to remain one until I'm 86. I'm not sure that it's... <laughs> and there's too, many, there's too many kids who are too... Not as kids, not all, a lot, are very, very influenced by their parents. So, yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that, um, that lowering the voting age is a, is a, a, is a genius plan. I think of, of, of the problems we face, it's, it's not by any means the biggest. But I, I understand the Green Party because we do, if under that, we do get a certain which never translates into um, getting a voice in Parliament. And, and that system does seem unfair. We, we would have to um, be resigned to the fact that if we'd had PR in the last, not this last election, but on before, for instance, um, we'd have got, what, eight seats? Mm. Um, and we would all have gone, yay, eight yep. seats, great, good. Uh, UKIP would have got, what, 20, I think? Yeah, which is fine. I mean, I've, you know... A lot of the people who want the Green Party to get more seats are equally vehemently, passionately uh, against UKIP in, in all its forms and would be horrified. So, you you know, you have to be careful what you wish for. I, I, I would like CPR. I think it's a, 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 a better system than our... And our, our system is getting worse and worse through um, successive layers of gerrymandering to the point where it becomes dysfunctional. So I, I, mean, I, yeah, I think I, PR is coming, and I wouldn't be surprised if it's with us within five years. Well, I hope so. Uh, and, and the notion that, you know, in, in the, the election debates we had in, um, in Scarborough and Whitby, uh, we had the Tory candidate saying, well, the problem with... PR is you end up with unstable governments who have to make um, um, unstable alliances, whereas at least our first past the post system, you get, he says, yeah, you yeah. get strong governments who can just um, stick with whatever they said they would do. Yeah. That, I mean, that comes back to the consensus point that, you know. Just, I, I, even as he said it, I thought, uh, Robert, you are going to regret saying that, but, you know, he's a Tory, he's not going to regret anything. Isn't he in a safe seat as well? Although Labour did come within 4,000 mm. um, um, of unseating him. Um, yeah. Well, maybe they will uh, next time. I mean, I think there's an appetite for... It's not so much... It's not socialism that is attracting people to the Labour Party. It's the austerity thing. I think the Tories have cottoned on to that. It's just they're not authentic. You can't believe that they're being authentic about, you know, what Mrs May is saying about... Uh, you know, we've got to do this better and prioritise oh, mental she, health. And... I mean, their approach to austerity is just to make it more efficient. Yes. That we should all save more, yeah. harder, longer, yeah. better. So, yeah, it's 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 it's, it's cobbler. Yes, I agree that, that 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 this election was about austerity. With the success of your prediction that we would have an election within two years, yeah. last time round, what about this one? Are yeah, you, I think we'll have think an election might... before two days. Yeah. This time, um, I said to Robert Goodwill, the, the Tory, I said, well, don't get too comfortable because we'll be back here within a year. Yeah. Um, but 
Um, I certainly hope know, so. Making, making predictions about these things is, yeah. you know. Yeah. Well, look, um, we've I, done... I, I, I can't see the Tories slogging this out because they can't really get their programme. They, they can't do all the things they want to do. She called that election because she thought, this is our moment. This is where we've got to go for it. And I do think the globalists mm -hmm. of both left and right, and there are left-wing globalists, um, they are thinking now's the moment. This is where we go for it. Yeah. What and do you make of Macron along? Uh, and, uh, and, and I think that's what she wanted to do. The fact that it's not happened for her um, uh, means that I think that they'll just want to get s something substantive uh, agreed for Brexit so that it's so that we're on the downhill slope so that we can't scramble from their point of view you can't scramble back up mm. um, and then I think they'll um, they might get rid of Mrs May I think they would have before now except who their right mind would sacrifice their political career to stand in her shoes so she she's got to be the one who ends up under the bus and she will be mm. um, and then and then I think they'll They'll call another election. Yeah, well, give but, Corbyn the hospital pass. <laughs> well, I hope because I mean it is I mean, a possible. I, I mean, I, in, in his case, it is still in control of the Labour Party. I says or not, I think he's done the country a great service by at least throwing open the doors and windows mm -hmm. of our political discussion the way they had been been successfully um, nailed shut by the Blairites as if the outside of the very narrow centre ground didn't exist anymore. Yeah, well, I think right, on right, those I'm, grounds, the country owes him uh, yeah. a vote of thanks, on those grounds yeah. alone. I, I agree with you, but the and, and I want to see him in government, but I, I think the problems only start there. You know, we talked about the Grand Coalition idea. Because you come back to money and the global money power. Well, this this is yeah. and that's the what hospital I said in the election project. It was a very difficult one for me because I wanted to see Corbyn do well. I wanted someone to make sure the Tories didn't get a majority. So I, I, I was not anti Labour. So it made it very difficult, therefore, in all good conscience, to run a good solid campaign. What I said is, I I understand people want to vote, but a, a lot of the people who might have because they see Labour as being able to beat the Tories. And I agree. The problem is this. I think Labour are the only party that can beat the Tories. Tories are the only party that can beat Labour. And our politics is stuck in those two sides, absolutely fixated on each side wanting to beat the other. The problem is neither, I don't think, can beat the problems and the powers set against this country. The problems that actually fate us, I think neither the, the Tories don't want to beat them, and Labour, I do not. That's my problem. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm delighted that Labour can beat the Tories. But they can't, they don't yeah. yet show to me that they understand how to beat the problems set against us. I mean, it looks, it looks highly unlikely that they will be able to form a government without some sort of coalition, even with the SD with the uh, Scottish National Party. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it was about what happened in Scotland, that the SNP lost so many votes. But I, I you know, I wonder whether that was their attitude to Brexit. I, I mean, I don't could, know. Could I, well I'm be. no expert. I, I don't know. I mean, um, I, I think that's, 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 well, that's quite possible. Well, Brexit was tied uh, up with the, the, the new the referendum. Whole Brexit thing, is that that no one has none of the media have told the truth about Brexit for so long mm -hmm. that it's very difficult to feel, no matter what you've read, that you are genuinely well informed about the truth. I don't feel I, it's a subject. I don't yeah. feel I can honestly say. I, D David, you know, we've got it has opinions swung against Brexit. Mm -hmm. A whole set of newspapers and pundits will tell you absolutely yes. And another set will say, no, it hasn't. And, and certainly the election vote would suggest that um, Bre this rolling back Brexit wasn't the number one thing for the voters. If it was, they would have all voted SNP. Yeah. Sorry, not um, um, SDP. SNP. So, yeah. No, Social Democrat, whatever. The, the Scottish called, National you know, Party. Yes. No, 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 no. I'm talking. If, if, if everyone's opinion about Brexit was that 
absolutely, we've all, all, all the people who voted Brexit now um, have changed their minds and it was all, so that was really at the forefront of their minds. They'd have all voted for the, the, the SDP, wouldn't they? Because they were the ones who said absolutely. What, the Lib Dems? Well, yeah, the Lib Dems. Sorry, yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. The, the, we've, the got a message, we've got a message from happen. we've got a message from David McKechnie saying that um, saying we would have got 25 forward. seats in 2015 which I'm assuming that's either the Green Party or UKIP uh, uh, that would have been UKIP okay right okay yeah I mean I, personally I'm a big fan of Nigel Farage I know that will cause howls with some people but Yes, it's, 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 it's not, I, I'm not a big fan of, of Nigel Farage by, by any means. Um, I, I just found the whole Brexit thing to be... I think both sides of that debate could have made honest and strong cases. And it's, mm. it's a puzzlement which I think generations of historians are going to yeah. work away at. But the, ca the cases were there. I mean... To make dishonest arguments. When they could have made honest ones. That's have you have you heard of Richard North? Sorry? Are you have you heard of Richard North? No. No, I don't think I have. Sorry. Well he writes in the Telegraph and he's written two books on Brexit and they're brilliant. Um, oh, okay. uh, and and he advocates a a, a solution called Flexit. And yeah. and um uh, there's there are others uh, who who have made, you know, very, very good cases. Yeah. Look, we've been but, up this uh, an hour and twenty. My, sorry, Roger, but my my I, mean, I I was asked to do several public discussions at the time of Brexit, you know, where they got all the parties together, and a, apart from the business about it's not what you want to leave, but what you'll be left with. The other thing I said was that, and I, I feel this very strongly, that I felt we were having the wrong discussion, that we were being encouraged to be absolutely fixated on this question of staying in Europe or not staying in Europe, where I felt the real discussion we ought to have been having was about, do we sign up to um, these neoliberal globalist trade agreements or not? Um, and I just felt that the way to make sure that, you know, if, 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 if a, a pickpocket doesn't want you to look at what he's yeah. doing with this hand, he gets you to look at this one. Yeah. I, and I felt that's a lot of what it yeah. was. I just felt, I felt that most of the problems that face this country would not be solved which, whichever way the, the vote went. Yeah. And, and therefore I said, the fact that we're being told to look, concentrate on this, get, um, get fixated on this, get worked up about this, make, you know, have this be the consuming issue that you concentrate on, uh, I just felt, well, that makes sure that we don't look at anything. I agree with so. you, David. You did a very good video called, List, uh, or blog, Listening to Brexit. Oh, yeah, uh, Afterwards, and, and, I mean, it struck a chord with me. Um, and, and, you know, I think, you know, you should be congratulated on that. Uh, yeah, David said it, it was 25 seats the Green Parties would have got, um, and UKIP would have got 66 seats uh, okay, fine, in 2015. Yeah. Thank you for, uh, for telling me that. Yeah, I, thanks, David. That's that, very kind. Um, I, I remember thinking, yeah, I, I'm in favour of, of proportional representation, but you have to realise that other, other, what you might call um, extreme or fringe um, concerns will also get an area. Yeah. That's that's what PR does. It means that the things which aren't right at the centre get 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 some uh, get a voice yeah well and, we have it here um, in sweden and it seems to work perfectly well although yeah, I, I lots of people will say it doesn't I just think but you I need to be realistic you know, yeah. yeah so so um farage and you know the whole business about um, foreigners are the problem mm -hmm. would have got what was it 60 seats yeah well, okay I, I, to <laughs> just be just fair to him i don't think that's what he's had one whinge about it yeah. so that's what he actually says i mean i, I I, I, I don't think that's his view. Um, no, their their I, 2015 I, I, manifesto was very similar to the Green Party um, manifesto, apart from on green issues, because he doesn't like windmills um, and, and wants to frap the hell out of the place, which I think yeah, he's wrong I, about. I, I, 
I think it's wrong about that. a discussion and, yeah. and, a, and a very fraught one about mm. the whole, you know, yeah. the immigration, um, racism thing. It, it's a, it's a, it's I a don't, vast I don't, discussion. I, don't, I just don't see as a racist. I mean, I don't think Tommy Robinson is a racist. I mean, there we are. That's the cat amongst the pigeons. But I, 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 I really genuinely like Tommy Robinson. I think he's an honest guy. I've never met he, the man. Um, certainly some of the things that he's been reported to have said alarm me, but I do, uh, I do know that some of the way that the, um, that the, early, the legend that's been created about the early years of him in that organization has been a manipulated legend. And, and again, I just think you, I would rather disagree fundamentally with people on the basis of the truth rather than disagree with them fundamentally on the basis of a set of convenient lies. It's, it's, it's the resort to lies, which is what is corroding our public life. Well, if you want to disagree with, with um, Tommy Robson, then, then do so on the basis of the truth. Yes. Well, and, and there's plenty to disagree with him. You don't need yeah. to have lies to disagree with the man. Yeah. I mean, I do disagree with him with a lot of problem, things about about Islam. I don't think he's a very good theologian. Uh, but I think... <laughs> That's putting I, it mildly. I, I but think, let's not even get into that unless I, we're going to spend a day doing yeah. it. Because I, let, let's do thought. geopolitics. I wrote a, an article about it, and it was a very difficult article, and I did it with enormous trepidation. Yeah. And this was Culture well. Matters. I was, I was a very that. difficult thing yeah. to write. I, I agonised about it. I, and I, I sent it to most of the top people in the Green Party saying, what do you think? And they were reluctant. They, they, they left. Well, I thought it was an excellent article and it really, I, I think you were quite surprised because you, you did say to me that you were a bit worried about it. Um, and yeah, I think, I I think I we were both quite surprised that it was well received. I mean, people do want some honest discussion. Yes, at the moment we don't have honest discussion. At the moment yeah. I think what we have are people saying the point of view that I'm adhering to and the point of view that I am opposed to, mine is so important and theirs is so dangerous that all tools or all, all, all strategies are justified, including um, lying and misrepresenting. Yeah. And yeah. the problem is when both sides do it, both sides know the other side is doing it, Neither side want to admit their side is doing it, and then you have a recipe for the poisoning of democratic yeah. discussion. Mm. And worrying. that's what worries me, Roger. Yeah. Yeah. Can you do another five minutes? Should we do a little bit about what's happening in the Middle East and geopolitics and how that all ties in? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> uh, we, we've been at it an hour and a half, so that's quite yeah, a long time. We should stop at 9.30. People will have lost the will to live. Yeah, right? okay. Um, I think what's happening in the Middle East is, I've felt for a long time, that we are in the midst of the Great Gas War, the undeclared war. There's a northern theatre, which is Ukraine, which has gone a bit quiet, and there's a southern theatre, which stretches from Syria down to Yemen. Uh -huh. And I think the Great... The, in, in the southern theatre, the, 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 the teams are... Saudi, Israel, America, on one side, um, the the um, Assad, Russia, and Iran on the other, uh -huh. and um, Saudi has separately um, got a huge um, argument, a struggle for supremacy going on with Qatar, uh -huh. and that has now got mixed up in it. The Saudis have decided to try and um, brand Qatar as being um, the, the, the supporters of racism, which is astonishing since if, if yeah. there's any country that funds ISIS and the rest of it and Wahhabism and, the, and, and it's Saudi, but they fund those people the way they fund um, um, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and um, Al Jazeera. You know, Qatar funds Al Jazeera, and Al Jazeera is allowed to be critical of everyone except Qatar. Yeah, I mean, I and think there's I think a difference Saudi between Saudi Al Jazeera and the, and the Muslim all, all Brotherhood. Religious fanaticism, as long as you don't do it here. Yeah. Um, 
so I, I do think there's a, that we are approaching a proxy war, and it, it, it is the, the hegemonic powers that, that have been uh, yeah. America and, and Israel and Saudi feeling threatened by a new set of powers. Saudi threatened by Qatar. I think Israel feels very threatened by Turkey. Um, um, America continues to feel threatened by um, Russia and um, Ir Syria and uh, Iran are caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. It hasn't spilled over into Iran, and I don't think it will. But um, but again, I've been criticised heavily within the Green Party for um, not taking the simple view of saying we should carry on overthrowing Assad because Assad's terrible. Yeah, what did you make of Jonathan I'm not Bartley's? Sure uh... is the right way to Iraq, Iraq or in Libya. No. But but I get criticised heavily, heavily and, and told that I'm a, a shill for right wing dictators and that you know I, I like these people, yeah. which is disappointing that that that's the only discussion there yeah. is. But that's uh, yeah, well, it that's was interesting what, what you wrote about Jonathan Bartley's reaction and statement about Trump tomahawking Syria. It's a whole other discussion, Roger, for yeah. another day. Yeah, yeah. Well, look, I think we should wrap up now. Oh, and um, uh, what, I, what I'd like to say is I would really like it to know if people want to let Roger or me know if this was useful, if you want, if you've had enough of me for a whole lifetime and I should just go away or... Um, cool. Okay. And the stream will be live. And w what I'll do is... is um, We'll, we'll come off air now so that processes and I'll put it on just to see if anyone hangs around and wants to ask some ask some some questions just just yeah. for two minutes if then, people want to ask questions yeah. then there, there are eight people them. still watching there were 115 at one point um, so I'm going to shut off the live thing for now and, well, well, thank um, you, Roger, and thank you, everyone on. who watched. And I hope it hasn't yeah. been too. Boring. Well, thank you, David, and hopefully we can do it again. Let's. Uh, mm. We'll just say.